We sometimes think that the past was somehow very sort of sedate and it had its own nice current and all of that. Actually, no, the world is constantly changing. The way somebody lived in the 19th century is not how they lived in the 15th century versus now and the future. And that's what makes the study of history also fascinating because you're not studying a static concept. The language you and I are having this conversation. Why are two Indians having this conversation in the English language? The answer lies in history. Historians are also human beings. None of us were there. We are also sitting here connecting the dots and trying to understand what happened in the past. Sometimes we connect them well, sometimes we don't connect them all that well. So there's a certain humility in that. Gossip is a big source of information. Now, we think of the British Empire and we think that you know they, they came and they oppressed us and they ruled us with an army and so on. No, a lot of their power came from knowledge. And that knowledge wasn't just about economic data and how much revenue a certain province was producing. It was gossip. <laughs> Hi Manu, welcome. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited about this conversation. You know, I think I have always liked history. Uh, I remember reading uh, Nehru's book, Discovery of India in college. And that was an eye-opening book for me because, you know, the idea of history for me until that point was what we read in school about key dates and key figures and memorizing those for exams and so on. And here was this, you know, very different narrative. There is, you know, very colorful story and... Uh, uh, explanation of you know how India came to be is probably a bit dated and we'll get into that later as we talk about but you know and a uh, couple of years ago Manu I met you and you know read some of your books and you know it was very refreshing to see you uh, pick up history as a profession and go very deep and you have access to you know a lot of very interesting sources etc which you are able to translate into such relatable human story so I want to start with you know what interested you in history how did your association with history and eventually committing to history as a profession start for you? I think the answer would be a very personal one. Uh, it didn't begin so much with thinking about the large questions of history. It began with a personal quest as to who I was and what my place in the world was, which if, you know, in your teens is when you start becoming a person, right? From a child, you become an individual. And around then, I would think about these things. I started reading quite seriously. And in my own family, if I had to give an illustration, my paternal grandfather was a villager. He was a farmer in a village. He told me that he smoked his first joint of marijuana when he was eight years old. Uh, he, in his 20s, he was a gunda, and he was illiterate. In a 99% literate state, he was a Malayali. Uh, he was an illiterate man. He smoked up, he became a gunda in his 20s, uh, married once, that marriage didn't go well, then he married my grandmother, settled down and became a farmer. And then he lived a life where they had a, a little bit of land. It was completely subsistence farming. What they grew, they consumed. That was the kind of existence they, 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 they lived in. Uh, he was also a very violent husband. Um, very different world from mine. By the time I was growing up, we were borrowing things from the British Council, watching these fancy shows that were produced by the BBC, went to good schools. There was a car, there was a driver, there were all kinds of other privileges that were there. And simply sort of making sense of that, that a generation ago or two generations ago, my grandfather was literally tilling in a field. And whereas by the time I was growing up, things had completely changed. That created a question in my mind as to what exactly led to this transformation. Whenever I went back to the village, I couldn't connect to my cousins there because they lived in a very different world. I lived in a very different world. We didn't speak the same language. I mean, we obviously I can speak Malayalam, but you, you see what I mean, right? We didn't have the same interests. We occupied practically different planets. And there the question then led me to that middle generation, my father, the choices he made. He left the village, he joined the Air Force at a very low rank, used the money to do his BA, MA, LLB, MBA, whatever it was then found his place in the world, ended up luckily marrying my mother who gave him some more common sense. And through that, we ended up benefiting. So everything I had, making sense of who I was, my place in the world, what choices I had available to me, all of this depended on, the, on that pivotal decision my father took of leaving the village. And that I think if you extrapolate to a wider kind of, through a wider lens to society at large, everything we do today, every option we have, every problem we are facing is a consequence of choices made in the past. Yeah. So history matters because our present is shaped by things that happened in the past. And unless we understand the past, unless we understand how we got here, how we decide our future also hangs in the balance. And this realization led you to study history during college? You know, how did this 
transition and is probably, I'm guessing, gradual commitment to history. How did that journey unfold? Uh, history itself wasn't uh, my core subject at that time. I actually did my major and my undergrad in economics and international relations because there was this time when I thought I would work in foreign policy and things like that, which is how I ended up working with Shashi Tharoor also because he's, he'd been in the external affairs ministry. He was chairman of the committee on foreign affairs and parliament and all of that. Um, so that happened. That was my intended direction. But about the age of 18, I came across, I was reading a lot of history, but then at 18, I came across this interesting historical character who had been forgotten, who was very fascinating. The life story was quite dramatic. And that took a life of its own. And I started researching that story, went into the archives, went into private documents and asking questions. And that took over my life for the next six years. Which character was this? This was that, what led to the ivory throne, my first book, uh, a lady called Setu Lakshmi Bai in Kerala. And that... Once the book was done, once I, those six years were spent and I, I realized that, okay, this was fun, I felt a small vacuum. I was still doing interesting things in my career. I was working with interesting people. But I realized that around then that, okay, I want to keep doing more of this. I want to do more history. I want to study history. I want to write books. And it took a life of its own. And from there, I transitioned slowly into a full-time career as a writer and a historian. Incred and I ended up doing my PhD in history. Right. Incredible. Looks like you're on a... Pretty good trajectory. I think you've written multiple books. We'll talk about yes, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, you know, this whole thing about, you know, the dramatic changes in three generations, how life was back then and how it is now. And it was interesting as you're telling about, you know, grandfather's story. It reminded me of my great grandfather. This is a story, you know, I heard from family. Hopefully, mostly true. It's a very colorful story. It's uh, apparently this guy was uh, a Pahalwan, mm -hmm. pretty well known Pahalwan in the 40s and 50s. And at some point, he won like major championship and the local, you know, I don't know, Jamidar or ruler, he gave him like bunch of temples. And then the whole family have been living off the income from those temples in Badeshwar uh, near Agra for many generations. And at some point in 70s, government nationalized all those the temples and all the temples were taken away. And suddenly these guys, you know, collapse. went from nothing to all this temple income to collapse. And I think a lot of us, you know, the, the choices, you know, my mother's side of family made as a result, a lot of them ended up in Delhi, some people went to, you know, business and so on. But it's like, it's impossible. And this is, you know, I was hearing these stories in these stories in 80s and 90s when I was growing up. And this was just uh, four or five decades ago. Like, you know, like I grew up in a BHL township, you know, very organized township, access to decent schools and healthcare and all that, right? And it's a, so probably, you know, the, what happened, you know, around independence, the how life was there few decades and now I think it's, you know, all of us probably have these stories of, you know, yeah. this massive transfer in three generations. And it's often very dramatic right. because we sometimes think that the past was somehow very sort of sedate and it had its own nice current and all of that. Actually, you no, know, the world is constantly changing. Right. There is no one past, you know, every century something is different. Yeah. The way somebody lived in the 19th century is not how they lived in the 15th century versus now and the future. Right. You know, the options your kids have are not the options you had or the options your parents had. So it's constantly changing, it's constantly, it, it's evolving, it's a dynamic sort of space. And that's what makes the study of history also fascinating because you're not studying a static concept. You're actually studying a highly dynamic space, except that it's in the past tense. Right. Which brings me back to your, so, you know, your choices of commitment to history, you know, as a profession. Uh, at what point you said, okay, I'm going to, you know, dedicate, I'm, I'm assuming that's the case and you're going to change your mind in five years. <laughs> but Hopefully that, not. Yeah. That you said like, I want to, you know, build my career around history, you know, doing your PhD, writing these books, you know, I know you continue to research, finding new topics, etc. Do you remember any particular point? And the reason I'm asking Manu is, you know, this, this is a somewhat of unconventional choice of career. Yeah. Like most people today, you know, they're in their 20s when thinking about their career, etc. Even people who study humanities like yourself, you know, probably study economics or something with a more practical utility. So at what age you said, like, this is it, you know, I've found my calling in life, I'm going to commit to this. Again, there was, I think, no moment. In, in retrospect, of course, I can think of a linear narrative saying this happened, this happened, and then I sort of, this thing dawned on me and that's how everything took shape. But I think life is also a series of lucky accidents and the luck also matters. For me, one great major boost was the success of my first book. Because it did well, it gave me a little bit of an incentive to think bigger and take a risk and think that, okay, hold on, maybe I'm able to pull this off. Maybe I'm able to do something of this. So I think that first book was a strong motivator. It took six years, it was back-breaking work, but it paid off. Now, for a lot of people, it may not pay off, so you may have to go back to your day job. Yeah. 
which is why I ascribe so much value to luck. Because for those who it, it doesn't work out, it is unfortunate because then you have no option. You have to fall back on something else. In my case, it worked out, and therefore I decided let me do more of this. Uh, I, I tend to be a bit of a planner. I'm very good at planning, slightly strategic in the way I think about what I want coming out when. So my first book was 700 pages. You know, it was one, two sets of characters in the 20th who both died in the 1980s, actually. Uh, their life story spread over 700 pages, weaving in a lot of broader history, but it was a relatively small, compact story. Consciously for that reason, the second book I did covers five centuries and 300 pages because I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could pull off a bigger canvas at a much brisker pace. So it's not a meandering, slow 700 pager, it's a fast moving kind of narrative. The third book is a book of essays, each is about four pages, because I'm again testing whether I'm able to condense history into 1000 words or 1500 words, because I'm, I've gotten used to 700 pages and 300 pages. Can I tell a story in four or five pages? So each I try to do something different and therefore each ended up appealing to different audiences in the broader set of people who are interested in history. So my third book of essays, I call it my airport reads book because kids would often tell me at literary festivals and so on that they used to find history very intimidating, which is why I wrote these short essays in the hope that you it, it doesn't overwhelm you. You can take an interest in it and if it interests you, then the next time you'll pick up a bigger history book because you're no longer scared. So in a sense, I was sort of looking at different formats also and different kinds of books, different ways in which to, to sort of handle this history. Uh, even the writing, right? So you do a kind of playful writing, you do a kind of irreverent writing. For my PhD thesis, I've done very serious writing with jargon and all the all, the, all those heavy academic terms. Each of these is also a way of shaping up your own style, giving your own voice its texture. And I think that ends up uh, also playing a role. And do you have uh, some kind of writing ritual, like you have to write X number of words, or you have to write every day? Yeah, I'm very boring. I, I'm a creature of habit. So I wake up at about uh, 7.30, by 8.30 I go to my office, which is, uh, I, I take breakfast with me and sit there to start with. Maximum by 9 o'clock I've started my work. I then work up until about 12.30, which is when I go to the gym, because I need a break. Otherwise you're just plodding in front of a desk for the, for the whole day. Then I come back, have lunch. After lunch again, a few hours till about 7.30. 7.30 I stop. This yeah. is reading or writing or writing? Book? If the writing isn't going well, then I'll do reading, something related to it. If, say, book writing isn't going well, I'll do a short article for a newspaper, I'll do a travel essay, I'll do a different format of writing. So if I'm not able to focus on something for my book, I'll do some, some, some different version of writing. But every day, yes, uh, unless I'm traveling, then every day is, is spent writing. If I'm traveling, I don't take my laptop with me. That is the other rule. I don't take my work with me. So then I can cut off also and every now and then get a break from writing because there's also such a thing as overwork and you know, sort of saturating yourself that way. No, that's great. You know, you have a very clear ritual. You're committed to it. I think, I mean, at some level, we're all creature of habits, but often not very good habits. I mean, I did a whole episode on the habit, you know, and the power yeah. of habits, right? You know, just uh, doing something day after day for the whole year and multi-year, you know, that's how things add up, right? But I think boring is good. Boring is good. Habits yeah, are concerned, right. I think boring is good. Uh, so one of the things, I was just talking to, you know, some of the a lot of younger folks, you know, who watch um, this uh, podcast and getting input out from your perspective, you know, what's interesting from history. Some of the people question this question about why is history even important? You know, stuff happened a long time ago. It's not relevant anymore. World has moved on and so on. Why should we care about history? So as somebody, you know, who's looks at history so closely, what is your articulation to yourself? You know, why history matters to you and perhaps why you think it matters to your society at large? Well, we're sitting in Bangalore, right? The shape of the city, the condition of its roads, the way the city is expanded, Everything depends on how people planned the city or didn't plan the city a few years ago. So yeah, it's probably more the latter in this area yeah. for Bangalore. Everything we're suffering now is directly contingent on history. In Delhi, you can't breathe the air. It's because of decisions that haven't been taken or were taken, but not the right decisions. Uh, the language you and I are having this conversation, this is a good example, right? Why are, why are you and I having in the 21st century sitting in South India? Why are two Indians having this conversation in the English language? The answer lies in history. It is colonialism, it goes back to things that happened centuries ago and yet affects our life even today. Why is it that kids go to English learning classes? Because that's, it's a passport to social mobility. They get ahead in life by picking up a language that was born on an island far, far away, but somehow ended up becoming the language of power in our country. So history isn't something that happened a lot of centuries ago as if it happened in some unconnected box. 
It's something that is directly affecting us even today. The clothes you and I are wearing. In visiting in India, again, why are we wearing these clothes that were designed in foreign countries, that have foreign origins? It doesn't mean we are foreign. But how these clothes ended up taking over the world, what they signify, the colors we wear, the, the kind of language we speak, our costumes go back a hundred years. Everybody wore turbans of different styles. I, I still remember this. If you look at the first report of the Indian National Congress meeting in the mid 1880s, mm -hmm. uh, there was a journalist who reported saying it looked like a fancy dress ball because everybody came wearing these different costumes. Because the India of the 19th century, people still wore their traditional clothes, which were very regional, mm -hmm. very local. Their turbans gave away their caste position, their, their economic position and all of that. Now we don't wear turbans. Yeah. In hundred years, everything has changed, right? So our clothes, our, our, our posture, our furniture, our language, everything is ultimately dependent on history. Wow. You can't make sense of the present if you don't have history. Yeah. And I think so going back to the point you are making, right? You know, there is a lot that you know, our world operates in a certain way on a day-to-day -day basis, but also on a structural basis. And the study of history helps us probably develop a deeper understanding, first of all, how it came to be. So there's an intellectual curiosity part of, point of view, but also, you know, we take either things for granted, let's say for example, India-Pakistan dynamics. Now today, you know, people in India see Pakistan a certain way. I'm sure people in Pakistan see India a certain way, right? Uh, but that's a very recent phenomena. If you go back, you know, 100 years ago, probably it was very, very different. I mean, obviously, there was not even an idea of Pakistan, India. I forget about, you know, uh, that. I was having conversations with some of our team members about, you know, we're just talking about history of various states. At some point, you know, uh, MP, you know, came up, Madhya Pradesh, and just asking, you know, so, what is MP known for? Like, what is the original heritage? Yeah. And we were all drawing a blank because it was created, you know, uh, just very recently. You know, we I didn't know until, you know, like, you know, you know, it was just part of various other yeah. regions and so on, right? It is very new phenomenon. Put so together, kind of. It was put thing. together, right? You know, because in the kind of middle of, it was large land, unoccupied, uh, largely unoccupied also, a lot of jungles and so yeah. on. And there were princely just, states, there were right. all kinds of other formations. So yeah. all these things, right? But Okay, agreed, you know, so that's, uh, you can develop a better perspective and probably people who are, you know, uh, responsible for policy making, um, you know, at a very local level, uh, need to understand history at a certain level. But how should one pursue studying history? Like most people are not going to study history in college and you're a working professional, you have interest in history. Yeah. What are the best way for people to adapt, you know, and history in some ways also depends on, it's also very vast. It's not like, one history. Yeah. For same time, there are many different versions, different people written at different times, Correct. different areas of history. There's Indian history, there's global history, there's recent history. There's a, how should you know somebody who's interested in history you know, pursue their interest? So to begin with, it's not just about forming a deeper understanding. It's also about contextualizing things. So you're in business. A lot of people who work in the business field, they find that in our country, there's still so much regulation. Markets are still not completely open, etc. Again, the answer to that, is, to that lies in our socialist phase, in a culture that came up at a particular moment, partly linked to the freedom struggle, it goes back further, right? So even decisions that are taken now in the 21st century of a very, very, very contemporary nature end up being affected sometimes in a negative sense by these things. So even to contextualize why these decisions are being taken, we need to go back on political culture. So we're talking business, but in reality, what affects business is political culture. What affects political culture is historical trends that are rooted in the freedom struggle and whatnot. Sometimes individuals, you know, individuals and their convictions, and if they're powerful individuals, that ends up affecting this. But in terms of how people can, you know, learn more about the past, etc., you're right, history is not one commodity. I sometimes give the analogy of Ravana from the Ramayana, which is probably not the best because he's also the villain of the story. And hopefully historians aren't seen as villains, but uh, with his 10 heads and 20 hands and arms and so on, that's essentially what history is like. To different people, it can look different. Uh, sometimes based on the material we have, the conclusions will change. History is an evolving field. So as more and more material comes in, in front of a historian's eye, the conclusions also change. So the expression on the face is also constantly changing. You have no guarantee that what is true 100 years ago is necessarily going to be true in the exact same way 100 years later. Because historians are also human beings. We are also, none of us were there. We are also sitting here connecting the dots and trying to understand what happened in the past. Sometimes we connect them well, sometimes we don't connect them all that well. So there's a certain humility in that. So I think if people are interested, there are different ways in taking an interest. You can take an interest in biographies. For me, that was a big thing. I'm always interested in the people in history. Human beings, how did they deal with their challenges? How did they deal with the, the contingencies they faced? How did they deal with problems that came up in their time?
what was the emotional texture of history. Again, history is not just dates, five battles, three empires. That's a very disembodied history. History has an emotional texture and flavor also. It has something that gives it life. There is a breath in it that, that animates it. And there human beings become very important. So a lot of people may connect to history through biographies. For some people, it's buildings and monuments. Because buildings and monuments are also, they, they also sort of represent specific moments in the past. So in, since we are in Karnataka, uh, if you go to Sri Rangapatna, there's Tipu Sultan's summer palace there. Now you can think of Tipu as this king who fought battles, inscriptions, did this, did that. But you go and look at his building and you get a very different insight into his mind because it has this huge mural painting depicting the Battle of Pollalur of around 1780. And it's a work of propaganda. He's trying to show his image of what happened there, uh, where he won that battle. So he's shown in all this carnage. There's headless corpses, arms have been chopped off, but very arithmetically correct. Huh? For every headless uh, body, you'll find a head somewhere in the painting. So in the middle of all this, he's on a big horse smelling a rose as if he's in a garden. Because he's, you know, showing that I'm such a confident victor, it doesn't matter, I'm winning this game. And the English opponent on the other side, a Colonel Bailey, I think, he's shown sitting in a palanquin, which is considered effeminate, you know, women sit in palanquins, chewing his nails, quite literally chewing his nails. So it's a work of art, but it's also a way of connecting to history. Sometimes you go to museums and you see something 2000 years old, and it's something as simple as a comb. It's something as simple as a lota. It could be anything. And yet you realize, oh my God, that's 2000 years old, right? So some people it's through objects. Some people it's through buildings. Some people it's through biographies and stories of human beings. For some people it can even be fiction in the sense that there is fiction that represents uh, particular moments in history and it, it, it encapsulates that emotional turmoil, etc. very well. So there's all kinds of formats in which to, to engage with the past. And in, in technical terms, now there are podcasts, there's YouTube, there's all kinds of ways to, do, to, to go about it. It's not just books. Although books still give you the most, it, it, gives you, it gives the historian the most space to do the research, to put the research down properly, to put the sources down properly, etc. I can definitely relate to biographies. I mean, that's a, one of my favorite genres to read. Um, I read a lot of, you know, uh, pretty much all of Walter Isaacson's books, you know, he's, and the thing is, you know, biography, you're rightly pointing out, it's not about a character, yeah. like, because you have to describe the historical context, what was the society like, you know, in which environment this person grew up, what the challenges were, what happened at school, what happened, you know, what kind of job this person was dealing with, so on, you end up getting this very vivid picture yeah. of, you know, how the life was, and of course, you learn about this person's life as well, right? Are there a lot of really good biographies of, um, important Indian historical figures, you know, which is readily accessible, you know, not in archives. Uh. It depends. I think in general, we've not fully done the art of biography well in this country. One reason is that we turn historical figures into these holy figures. So the moment somebody dies, they put on a pedestal, then you can't criticize them, then you can't talk about the negative things. But the fact is, they were human beings. And it's not about judging anyone. You and I are human beings. We have good shades and bad shades. We have good habits and we all have terrible habits. We have a side we show to the public, but we also have a secret intimate side which we might even be ashamed of. Yeah. Because human beings are like that. And every historical figure was a human being. They were made of flesh and blood. They were made of the same weaknesses. They were made of the same character flaws. And as much as they showed strength, they would have also had their weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, uh, so because, of, because we tend to romanticize historical figures, we sometimes don't do biographies in a way that truly does justice to that character. You find a lot of hagiographies in, in our country only praise. Yeah. This person was great, they were born great, they did great things, they were destined for great things, they died great. Yeah. Nothing beyond that. Continue to be great after death. Even after death, <laughs> build statues. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the kind of trajectory that we, we prefer for a lot mm -hmm. of historical figures. So to truly understand their lives, the historian or the biographer also has to get into the problem areas. Again, not to judge or not to somehow defame them, but to understand them better. Because sometimes it is psychological challenges that people face that lead to specific decisions, especially if you're in a position of power. Uh, for example, Mao in China had a major sleeping problem. He was practically addicted to sleeping pills. And isn't it an interesting question as to how much that affected his, the rest of his behavior? I mean, one doesn't want to speculate, but clearly there are linkages between all this. No? Uh, Indira Gandhi, the famous, the famous thing about her always having been told that she was not the good looking one in the family. And she had these aunts who were very nasty to her, etc. And she ended up once in power being quite nasty to the aunt, you know, <laughs> because the, the tables were turned. Yeah. So some of the pettiness also to understand in terms of understanding historical figures comes out of 
excavating some of these details in their lives. We also understand things about so social patterns better if you look into people's lives. When I was doing this biography of Setu Lakshmi Bai, of Travancore, not a very famous figure or anything, I was struck by how freely certain subjects were written about. For example, in letters to her father, she says, oh, I've got my periods now, so such and such a thing I can't do, I can't go to the temple or this and that. It's an open discussion with her father about her periods, and this is happening in the, in the 1910s. Whereas today we think, no, no, these are not things that daughters talk to their fathers about. But clearly this is happening here. Small things like, like, like marriage, especially in political settings, marriage wasn't a private affair. Uh, the consummating a, a marriage wasn't personal. There were political things hanging on it. So the, the Catherine de Medici, this, uh, this famous French uh, queen, when she married into the French royal family, he and she had to spend their first night in bed with an audience, well, much like your, your <laughs> camera team here. There was an audience, including yeah. a representative of the Pope, mm. the bridegroom's father. Uh. They were all present, watching this. Incredible. Because unless the marriage was consummated, mm. it was not legal. Mm. And the marriage was a political marriage, and therefore mm. they had to make sure it was consummated and the political alliance was sealed. Yeah. So, personal things end up becoming political. Yeah. Political things end up having personal consequences. Small details, yeah. you know. Uh, Shah Jahan, the, mm. the Mughal emperor, at one point when his father Jahangir is still alive, uh, Jahangir has a moustache, I think, but he's otherwise clean shaven. Shah Jahan grow, grows out a beard. Now, it's not just a matter of a man growing out facial hair. His, there's a biography uh, of his son, actually, by Supriya Gandhi. And she, she makes this point that it's not just about facial hair. It's about him making a statement against his father. Because he and his father were facing tensions then. On the one hand, he's posing as the more devout Muslim by growing out his facial hair. He's also physically separating himself from his father and carving out his own niche. So even something as simple as facial hair ends up having something political, a signification that is political. So that's why I think biographies can be beautiful spaces to explore a lot of things, so long as we do them transparently, so long as we don't turn historical figures into these sacred beings. If we are open to looking at them as human beings, we'll able, we, we will understand the past and their lives and their context in all its richness, with all its texture and layers, as opposed to taking, oh, they were born great, they died great. You know, that's a very meh kind of way yeah, of right. looking at it. I think it's a very important lens to you know, look at and study history from because people are fundamentally the same. You know, human nature has definitely not changed in the last thousands of years. Yeah. If you go further back and even read, you know, Greek and um, Greek history and philosophy and so on, it's all relatable. Even, you know, from our own tradition, if, you know, Buddhism, you know, what was written in the 5th, 6th century, Upanishads, it's so relatable, your know, thought process is so modern, yeah. right? So I think just realizing that we are dealing with living human beings, they have to, they have, you know, diseases, they will have family issues, financial issues, psychological issues, no but therapies even, back then. Even disappointments in love, this. Disappoint you know, if you go to any <laughs> monument in India today, you will find all these Kavita loves or, uh, you know, Maya <laughs> loves Mukesh kind of, you know. Maya doesn't love Mukesh. <laughs> all of those things on the walls. But what's interesting is there's, I, I forget where it is, 2000 year old cave yeah. somewhere up north, where there is a similar, uh, right. some guys carved his great love for a, a Devdasi, mm. I think, mm. into the walls of a cave there. And 2000 years ago. I think it's about yeah. 2000 years old, right. from the Ashokan period or just after. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, 2000 right. years ago, uh, also mm. couples in love felt this great impulse yeah. to carve it into walls for right. some reason. Yeah. And now kids, you know, the Mayas and Vocations of the world yeah. are also carving <laughs> things into into old monuments. I don't know where I've been, what have you been seeing? <laughs> but, uh, this reminds me, of, actually, I, I don't know if it's true or not, you know, my history is obviously very faint, but I remember, you know, Gandhi, when the day his father died, he was busy, I think he wanted to spend time with his wife, wife right? And later on, he had a lot of regret about that. Which it's ended up affecting, like, it was such a lot of guilt on his yeah, shoulders, right? Uh, that I'm pretty convinced that there is a link to him becoming celibate at the age of 36, or whenever he decided to go fully uh, into celibacy. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting question, you know, because he chose to go into celibacy, did he ask his wife? Isn't a wife entitled to, you know, that kind of affection also from her husband? So, again, that guilt perhaps of a 14 or 15 year old boy who was sitting with his father suddenly felt the need to go to his wife and then his father passes away and he feels that trauma. It's interesting how much it affects his life later, how much it conditions his very image of sex because he ends up seeing it as something negative, as something bad, as something to be guilty of. I'm reading a, I was reading a biography of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, Nehru's sister by Manu Bhagwan, will be released soon. And it's interesting how she got married and she and her husband, freshly married, newlyweds, went to see Gandhiji. And she was dreading this. She was dreading that he would tell her and her husband to go celibate. And <laughs> before he could say it, she said, no Gandhiji, this is not happening, Bapu. We've just married and I've married him to live with him as his wife. Yeah. 
And then Gandhiji sort of chuckles and says, okay, fine, you know, because clearly he had a reputation also for doing it. Now, it's a funny story, but it also, in that humor itself, we understand so many things, right, about social attitudes, about how women were expected to behave, how husbands were expected to behave, so many things. Mm -hmm. I've, in fact, had uh, conversations around this with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, because she, I used to ask her questions about how the household was arranged when she was growing up, and there were different disconnected units, you know, blocks of the house. And so there was one section where the women lived and the other section where the men lived. And in those days, there was no concept of private bedrooms for each member of the family. There was no such concept. People lived in communal settings. All the kids and women would sleep in one part of the house. The men would have different corners of the house. That's how they lived. Now, my grandmother came from a family where her mother had eight children. I asked her once, you know, how did your parents manage if there were no bedrooms? And she said she had never seen her parents together. Her mother was always in the women's block. Her father was always in the men's block. And I kept wondering, how did this happen? She said, yeah, that's a good question. Let me think. And then two days later, she came back saying, you know, as a child, I remember, we would hug our mother and sleep. And sometimes we woke up feeling cold because she wasn't there. Uh, and we were like, ah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. how all these eight children were born. <laughs> but again, because she doesn't censor things and I have a very open relationship with her, for me, it's not about my great-grandparents' yeah. marital life. It's really about understanding how in a joint family set up, these things worked. Because it tells you a lot about gender relations. It tells you about how society viewed these things etc. In, 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 in fact, in royal settings and all, again, there was no privacy. Like with the Setu Lakshmi Bai of Travancore, she was the queen of Travancore. When she got married, she was 10 years old. The marriage wasn't consummated. It was consummated when she was 14. But when it was consummated, it wasn't like her husband decided one fine day to go to her bedroom. It was astrologers who said, such and such a day that this Muharat, if you consummate the marriage, you'll have a child. Yeah. So a whole ecosystem was involved in it, in these two teenagers end ending up sleeping with each other, you know, uh, after their marriage, yeah. yeah you know, it's uh, super interesting to like contemplate, you know, things uh, from the perspective of individuals involved and some of them, you know, end up, you know, in small or big manner, end up being playing an you know, outsized role in the evolution of history. And some level, I guess, probably representative, representative of what's happening at large. Someone just happens to be a channel or in the right position at yeah. the right time and so on. But the, the social and cultural context is very, very important. It's probably driving, you know, big portion of their behavior. Yeah. But when you think of, you know, studying history at the such granular level, understanding about the you know, individual people's involved their life and everyday affairs, what are the sources, you know, today as a practicing historian, you know, how do you find all these, you know, specific details about what happened 300 years ago at the age of 14 for a particular person's life? You know, what are sources? How does, maybe a two-part question, you know, how do you do it in general? I mean, you, sorry, you do in particular and what are the tools available to historians today to be able to, you know, find credible source material, which I'm guessing probably will get sparse the further you go back in time. Yeah. So in general, the further back we go, it becomes very difficult. So I was reading a book by Patrick Oliver in, on Ashoka. Now Ashoka lived over 2000 years ago. So actually what we end up having is more questions and more interesting questions rather than convincing categorical answers because so much is left to connecting those dots. And when the evidence is so slim, it's more and more tough to connect those dots. In fact, somewhere in the book, he also mentions that if you look at Ashoka's inscriptions, his own words that have been recorded and are available to us, it's not more than 4,500 words total. Yeah. All the inscriptions put together, that's about how much uh, we have of Ashoka's own voice. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we have then is hagiographies that were written later, accounts that were written sometimes by enemies and negative figures or people who viewed him in a negative light. And you have to somehow connect those dots. But the closer we come to our time, the material becomes richer. So somebody like Gandhiji, firstly, he wrote extensively. He wrote on everything from his bowel movements to his personal life to what advice he was giving people. He had his flip-flops. What he wrote in 1920 may not be what he believed in 1940. He wrote some, at some moments racist things. Sometimes he apologized for it. You see that full complexity of the man precisely because you have that much data that he himself put out into the public domain through his newspapers and his, his journals and things like that. Uh, sometimes it can be things like diaries, because at one point, especially among the elite, it was very fashionable also to keep diaries. So you would have small little details that come up uh, that, you know, otherwise you may not access. Because they were bored, so they had because to they were, yeah. You know, they, would, they ended up yeah, recording what they did and who they ate, dined with and things like that. Uh, you then find that gossip is a big source of information. Now, we think of the British Empire and we think that, you know, they, they came and they oppressed us and they ruled us with an army and so on. No, a lot of their power came from knowledge. And knowledge was collected extensively from all over the place. And that knowledge wasn't just about economic data and how much revenue a certain province was producing. It was gossip also. Yeah. 
where was a certain prince going at three o'clock? You know, who had come to see them at what particular time and what did they talk about? In fact, as till the 1940s, almost every two weeks, the British residents in all the princely states of India would send something called a fortnightly report to the Viceroy's office. So everything that happened in two weeks in that state, whether it was political, personal, gossip, whatever, parties, weddings, everything would be condensed into a two or three sheet uh, document and sent off to Delhi. Now we have access to that. It's not always entirely factually correct. Some of it is speculation, etc. But yet it gives you a window into what was happening in those two weeks. It's as granular as two weeks. But then you go back to an Ashoka, no such chance. You got, you don't even have his exact date of birth and exact sort of, you know, uh, space of, of life and all of that, because it's so difficult. So what is the state of archive, let's say more, let's say recent history, last three, four hundred years, you know, from maybe from the time of Mughals and then obviously British, do you think we have a lot of unexamined, you know, archives and resources with a lot of fertile information that future historians will go pour over and cull out interesting stories? We do, we do. In fact, we've only scraped the surface of the material we have in this country. The tragedy is a lot of the material is getting destroyed simply because of age, because nobody's taking care of it, uh, you know, because time is passing and it's just languishing somewhere. But if you look at a lot of Indian language sources, you'll end up finding fascinating things. There's a book by a scholar called Divya Cheryan that's come out, uh, which is about 18th century Marwar or Jodhpur, that state in Rajasthan. And it's about caste and caste dynamics in that, in that region, built entirely on the local records of the local Darbar in their local language. And it's astonishing. It's completely revised some general ideas about caste and how caste took form in the modern period, etc. A lot of people say it was under the colonial rule that caste solidified and then sort of became this rigid institution. But she actually traces it back. She says this trend had begun in the 18th century itself. Because she went into an archive nobody had tapped so far and found something in a relatively obscure language that most people don't study or work on. Now, India has hundreds of like dialects and languages. We have dozens of recognized languages itself. In, I work on Kerala and in the, we have something called the Matilagam records in Kerala. Only a small fraction of it has actually been catalogued and recorded. Most of it is still uncatalogued. Yeah. So even the local scholars who work with these Malayalam records don't have complete knowledge of what the records yeah. are actually saying. So these records are where like, you know, What's such a state of archives in India and is someone working on digitizing all of this? Some of it is happening. Uh, for example, we have our national archives. Every state has a state archive. Sometimes there are private archives. So important families like these ex-royal families, they'll have their private archives. You'll have personal papers that are sometimes donated to institutions. So the Nehru Memorial Library, which has now been renamed in Delhi, a lot of important figures from the 19th century onwards, their private papers have been deposited there. So if I want, say, a Divan of Travancore from the 19th century called Nanupillai, mm -hmm. if I want to look at his papers, they're sitting in Delhi, in the Nehru Memorial Library, because his family donated it. Sometimes it's still sitting with private families. Yeah. So a lot of the correspondence of the British Viceroy, Lord Curzon, yeah. is, I'm now told, sitting in a garage in a bunch of boxes with somebody further down the family line, because that's the person who's inherited all this. Mm -hmm. And they've not donated it to anyone yet, or any library yet, so it's mm -hmm. just sitting there. And the, at least the ones which are in the public, you know, it's, who is responsible for digitizing? Is this the all this national state archives, you know, they are supposed to do is, do you think something needs to happen to accelerate their digitization so that in the next 10, 15 years, all of it is available at Pingri? They are. So doing Chat GPT can, you know, <laughs> write some interesting stories. Well, that's <laughs> scary for us. If Chat GPT starts deciding, you know, what to do with historical archives. But, uh, no, but a lot of digitization, digitization is happening. Uh, in fact, during COVID, it was quite useful also because we couldn't go anywhere, but we were still able to get some material uh, digitized. The National Archives does it. Uh, even other institutions, so one of the most astonishing collect collections in this country is the Saraswati Mahal Library in Tanjavur. Mm -hmm. You know, smallish place, a temple town. Mm -hmm. But there was this man called Sarfoji Raja in the early 19th century who collected one of the hugest sort of sets of Indian manuscripts. Anything and everything. Literary works, he has a, there's a manuscript copy of Krishna Devaraya, the Vijayanagara Emperor's Telugu work called the Amukta Malyada. There's one cop there's copies of that over there. There's botanical stuff, there's pictures that he's made of, of plants and things and animals, etc. Huge, huge collection. English books, German books, a bunch of things, all from the early 19th century. They're now digitizing that slowly. But when I went, I was a bit sad to see that it was essentially two or three people sitting with one or two gadgets, painstakingly digitizing each palm leaf, slowly, slowly, slowly going through it. Whereas in fact, if, you know, if they had a little bit more resources, just imagine the speed at which they'd be able to do But do you think like that's, that. uh, I mean, just going off tangent here, but you know, if there are interested individuals, you know, if you know, donate some money, etc., collect a pool, and can they help expedite some of this work? I think so. I think so, because a lot of it is manpower issues. It is 
issues with finding the material and the technology and the, and the gadgets that you need to do this properly. Because a lot of these things are also very fragile. These documents are not easy to handle. Yeah. Some of them, I've seen it, you turn the page and it yeah. crumbles in, in front of your eyes. Yeah. Because nobody's touched it in all these years. And it was sitting there like that and as you turn it, it fades away. It sort of collapses into, into pieces. Yeah. We are doing you know, four episodes on history. Hopefully enough people will be inspired and come forward and so probably can yeah. just put it out as a, you know, and he was interested in your call for help, you know, and then, you know, Manu will know where and, to and direct. you can frankly choose any institution close to you. It doesn't need to be one place, right? If you live in Mumbai, there's the Asiatic Society that has a huge archive. They're, of course, digitizing a lot themselves. They've got newspapers going back to the mid and early 19th century. Just look at the amazing sort of repository that is, you know, you have know you, what people were you, writing in mm. op-eds in 1820 yeah. because it's been digitized and now it's accessible for 12,000 rupees a year. Yeah. You know. Do you do you recall any of the op-ed from that time? Like any particular that caught your eye? There's um, so we think that it was only towards the late 19th century that Indians started articulating nationalistic feelings and so on. But frankly, I found uh, a bunch of uh, the, the, a newspaper sort of debate that was taking place in the 1840s, yeah. before the, even the 1857 rebellion, where actually very similar arguments that later the Indian National Congress and the nationalists would make were already being stated there. The economic ruin of India that the British were uh, taking over India and sort of milking it uh, for their own for their own purposes, which much later Dada Bhai Nauroji would sort of sharpen and, and write in the 1890s or so. It's already happening 50 years earlier. Which newspaper was this? This 1840 was the Bombay Gazette. Bombay Gazette. And by the way, this is again just the English language. Like there's Marathi newspapers. Because the problem though is a lot of the Indian material hasn't necessarily been preserved. Because these newspapers often had a very short shelf life. You often find a paper started say in 1829, by 1835 it's dead. So where, where are all the copies? Yeah. Nobody really knows. Sometimes things end up abroad. I have no idea how, but they ended up abroad. There was this one journal called the Feudatory and Zamindari India, which covered the princely states, etc. that I was looking for. I could not find any place in India that had the full set. But it exists in the New York Public Library and UC Berkeley in America. How they managed to get this obscure thing from India, I have no idea, but they have it. Yeah, let's hope in as part of researching India, we take better care of all these archives and whatever is available, at least for the last few hundred years, get digitized properly. Yeah. So that you know, thousands from now, someone can read a much better history yeah. and uh, not rely on the 4,000 words <laughs> which might survive. Which Ashoka. By yeah. Ashoka. Uh, I want to change gear, uh, Manu. And, um, you know, see, we are talking about history mostly in the context of India. You know, we have grown up with... Uh, certain notion about India, you know, we all know our national anthem and, you know, few patriotic songs and we celebrate 15th August and 26th January. We know little, some basic facts, but uh, there is a more, you know, you know, colorful, diverse story of India. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, if you just look at the diversity within India, we are probably most diverse country anywhere in the world. I think we are probably more diverse than European Union, which is, you know, I don't know, 2025, different countries, you know, while language is different culturally, you know, religiously, they're all nearly identical. While we have, you know, so many different customs, so different histories, you know, so many just diversity, you know, which is very deep rooted. So, you know, as a historian, you know, have you studied about India and different parts of it, you know, wh what is your current understanding? How does, you know, idea of India emerge? You know, what's in, what is, or maybe start with, what is your idea of India? You know, when you look at when we use the phrase India, you know, what comes to your mind? I think the difference between our identity as Indians versus, say, other nationalistic identities is precisely this. If you look at European countries, the emphasis is homogeneity. So whether it's Italy when it was unified, France when it took its current shape after the revolution, etc., there was a, a stress on homogenization. One language, one people, one religion, things like that. In India, that's never been the case. Our Indianness is, I think, diversity and it's because we ourselves intrinsically are diverse. So if I think of myself as an individual, on the one hand, I'm a Malayali. On the other hand, if I'm a casteist person, I can have a caste identity also and say I'm a Malayali of a particular caste. Within Kerala, I come from a specific region in Kerala. And regions also have politics. Huh? Like North Kerala, they don't like marrying South Kerala. So I'm from South Kerala. They say we are basically more cunning people, whereas they are somehow nicer people and so on. So there's that politics also. So a Malayali North Kerala will speak Malayalam in a different way versus the Malayalam I speak or grew up listening at home. So that's one layer of, of, of identities that I have. Then I have an identity as a South Indian because there is something that links, say, Malayalis with Tamilians, with Kannadigas and so on. That is a South Indian kind of thing. Then there is the broader Indian identity. 
Now, that broader Indian identity is often where debates arise because there are, there are some scholars who say that this identity was invented by the British. So the British came, they sort of politically created the current map that we have, and that's how we ended up becoming a nation. Some people will say, no, we've always been a nation forever. Yeah. I think the answer is always, as in most cases, somewhere in the middle. And you, you get rid of all these dramat yeah. dramatics that happens and you come to a more sober understanding. Nationalism is a new concept. Even in Europe and other places, it emerged practically in the 18th century. There were no nations before that. There were kingdoms. The king might be a point of focus, but there were no nations as such. That does not mean people did not have a sense of identity or a common feeling. Mm -hmm. So in India, a Malayali sitting in the south may have no idea how a Kashmiri lives in the north. Mm -hmm. No, because their languages are different, their clothes are different, their diet is different, their complexion is different. Mm -hmm. And yet, both the Kashmiri and the Malayali sitting in Malabar, they've both heard of the Ramayana, they've both heard of the Mahabharata, they've, both, they've all heard of Kashi, uh, things like that. There are cultural strands that bind them. Yeah. They may be thin in some places, thicker in other places, but they are there. Yeah. So the one example I often give is that a Malayali sitting or any South Indian sitting in, in the peninsula, they wouldn't understand the exact geographical location of Kashi. Mm -hmm. They have no idea where Kashi actually is physically, but they know there is Kashi somewhere up north, which is a cultural language that has been spoken. There is a cultural connection that runs through mm -hmm. the entire country in a certain way. It's helped by geography. The fact that we, are, we have the three seas at the bottom and we've got the Himalayas in the north gives a certain compactness also yeah. to it. But it's compactness almost on a continental scale. It's, I think the Euro European Union analogy is sensible when you compare in India. Because we're not comparing ourselves with Germany or France. We're comparing ourselves with something like the EU because we've got that much diversity, more than that, within the country also. Castes sometimes, again, language may vary, your religious systems may vary. So in the same, in my own ancestral place, before we do pujas in our private family temple to the goddess, you have to first give alcohol to a local community because they do pujas with alcohol and certain rites to that deity in the grove first. Until that is done, we can't start our puja. Two different communities, two different sets of styles of worship, very much at odds with each other. One is a vegetarian deity, the other is a non-vegetarian deity. And yet there are linkages. You, one cannot exist without the other. You know, you have to acknowledge each other and that's how it goes forward. So even our idea of tolerance of this plurality in the past was one where it was not like people were intermarrying constantly and happily getting along. It wasn't some paradise where you were holding hands and running together in a garden like in old Bollywood films. It was very much a case of you stay in your lane, I will stay in my lane. We recognize these are two separate lanes, but we will tolerate both, both of those lanes. Both are equally valuable, we accept both of them. It's just that we are not going to let them merge into one. So it's interesting. It's tolerance without homogenization. It's tolerance and acceptance without everybody blending into one. That, I think, has been the pattern in India in general. And it's very natural for Indian kids. Now, I'm a Malayali kid who grew up in Pune. For us, parents spoke Malayalam at home. We learned English at school. We played uh, on, on the streets outside our buildings or whatever, speaking a mix of Dakhani, Hindi and Marathi. You pick up languages also because there's so much happening around you. In a single classroom, there'll be a North Indian, a South Indian, there'll be all kinds of kids. The kids speak completely different mother tongues, yeah. and yet in the classroom, they're speaking a different language. For us, it's very natural to grow yeah. up with that kind of diversity, yeah. because that's just how it is. So diversity is there, you know, we can see it's always been there and so on. But as you kind of hinted, there's something also that unites that yeah. diversity. There are these, you know, uh, these cultural threads, which perhaps, you know, go back not even centuries, you know, but maybe, you know, a few thousand years ago, at least. Yeah. So let's talk more about that, you know, you know, beyond Ramayana, Mahabharata and you know, a few, what are all those other, you know, cultural threads that bind pretty much, you know, what let's say you can call it Indian subcontinent, people who have lived here, maintain their diversity and somehow the system was such that, you know, people were also able to maintain their diversity. It's not, no one really, at least, you know, at least wrong. My limited understanding faced the pressure to, you know, change or maybe, you know, there might have been some subtle undercurrents. But, you know, people, you know, Punjabis are very different than, you know, Bengalis, right? And that's been there, you know, as far as we know, for the longest period of time. So what enabled, you know, this one is preservation of the diversity and yet, you know, this strong sense, which is, you know, I don't know whether it's always there or grown stronger in last, you know, I don't know, a couple of hundred years. So what's, what's your understanding? I think um, one is political, because mm -hmm. if you look at empires and how they functioned in India in general, they were not centralized empires often power was diffused out. So you defeat a king, so long as the king accepts to be your vassal thereafter and pay you tribute, you leave him alone. 
Now this means that the king retains his individual political identity, his people retain their cultural identity, nothing is being forced onto you as such. It wasn't necessarily because these great empires and emperors sitting in India were somehow large hearted. It's simply that technology in those days did not allow for that kind of granular control. You had to be a little loose, you had to give space for people to exist on their own terms. Even, you know, just before the British, the, the, the Mughals, if you look at the way they ran their empire also, there were areas where the empire was directly in charge, but there were areas where power was decentralized. The Rajputs, in Orissa, there were tribal lords, for example. In the south, as they expanded further in the south, pockets would be retained by the main power, but a lot was outsourced and local powers were recognized and brought into the system. That itself allowed for a lot of diversity to stay without contradiction, because nobody was pressurizing you to follow one formula or have one political allegiance or loyalty. That was one thing. The other thing is pilgrim networks. If you look at the Kashi reference I gave earlier, people knew that pilgrimage was a way to unite people. So in the, in the 17th century, there was this um, Christian uh, chaplain of the Dutch, I think. He writes a book about local Hinduism in Pulikat in, in South India. And he talks about how the sacred geography of the Tamils includes Kanchivaram, it includes Tirupati, it includes a bunch of Rameshwaram, it includes a bunch of local temples. But then he also goes to the next level and says there's a broader sacred geography where you have Dwarka, which is in, in the west of India, you have Mathura, you have Kashi, you have you know other temples far, far away, nowhere in the horizon that any actual Tamil villager would be able to tell you about. But they know of its existence and those who do go out for these uh, pilgrimages, they end up visiting these places. You know, so there is a kind of connection that is built through pilgrimage and pilgrim networks and it's closely wedded to the politics. So once the Marathas became dominant in India, you find that when Marathas armies, armies moved uh, up north, as they'd go out on military expeditions, there'd be large numbers of pilgrims accompanying them. Brahmins would accompany them because they wanted to go to Kashi and then they would follow these because they got protection from these armies. They would follow and then they'd settle down in Kashi. In, in Kashi, that's why you have huge numbers of Telugu Brahmins, you have huge numbers of Maharashtrian Brahmins. At one point, the Maharashtrians were extremely dominant in, Vara in Varanasi. They're from the Deccan. What are they doing in this North Indian city? Because it is pilgrim networks connected to politics that enables that kind of movement. Uh, there are communities, the Marwadis, economic, and, and economic networks also allow them to spread out around the country. So if it's in Bengal, if it's in Delhi, if it's in Gujarat, you sometimes have branches of the same family transacting business, exchanging large amounts of large volumes of cash because it's run on family networks that are so diffused across the country. And if you go back to you know, before the time of British, we'll come to British in uh, some time, uh, and some of the people who were creating this, you know, uh, subcontinent-wide uh, empires, you know, Ashoka and then Mauryas and then, you know, uh, even some of the, you know, the, uh, the before Mughals also, you know, some of the, I think, people had reasonable deal consolidation. Is there any evidence of people you know, encouraging the, some kind of unified identity or it was just more organic. Somehow culturally things evolved. You know, people, as you said, like there are four boundaries, you know, three C and, yeah. and somehow they're just organic assimilation. We end up adopting, you know, similar kind of a... I, I think in those days there was this impulse for unity did not exist in, in the same way. For example, by our times, nationalism has come into play. So nationalism requires allegiance to one flag, one nation, one identity, one label that we all use. In earlier times, I don't think people thought like that. You know, you were able to have multiple identities without feeling any sense of contradiction. You know, so your local allegiance may be to a local king. That's all your connection is. He may be further affiliated to a higher king. That guy may be further aff affiliated to the Mughal emperor sitting in Delhi. The Mughal emperor is Muslim. This guy is Hindu. This guy might be Muslim again. You never know. Like, the, the linkages are very, very interesting, but also very complicated. So we're talking about different layers of identity as opposed to just one identity. All the same, one can't say that there wasn't a unifying impulse, whether it was the Guptas, whether it was Ashoka even. In fact, in Patrick Oliwell's book, he talks about how Ashoka does try to come up with a kind of civic culture. So he's not trying to say you must have one religion. He's not trying to say you must have one uh, identity or you must all dress a certain way or speak one language. But he's trying to create a common kind of civic culture in different parts of the empire. And that binds the whole empire together. A civic culture. Every other identity is also leg legitimate, but not... But, but this is the way through which all those identities are woven together into something common. So in earlier times, it was this question of weaving things together. Think of a fabric that is constantly expanding. It has no fixed shape. The ends of the fabric are constantly expanding. Different people are trying to shape it. They're trying to embroider things onto it. They recognize the fabric is one, but overall, it's not given a, a different, definite kind of shape. So Manu, before you know, 
diving deeper in the idea of India, and we are using the term India, but we also historically use Bharat, Hindustan. Like, just what is the historical context of these different words? You know, when and when they come in the you know everyday parlance. You know, two hundred years ago, which is the word people are using to describe the whole subcontinent? You know, were they even using India at the time, or was something else which was more common? That's a good question. It's a highly debated question whether two hundred years ago people were even using one word as such for this. For example, Hindustan never extended to all of India. It refers largely to North India, the Gangetic Belt, and that part of India, and doesn't include Punjab, doesn't include Bengal, doesn't include the South. Uh, when they spoke of towards the south, they spoke of the Dakhan or the Deccan because that is that was the identity that was used there. In these places, there was a kind of regional identity. So by the time Chhatrapati Shivaji emerges in the Deccan, there was also along with him the birth of a regional identity as Dakhanis. So if you look at some of his correspondence with the local sultans of of the Deccan Sultanate itself, he actually plays up this idea of all of them being Dakhanis resisting the Mughals who are coming from Hindustan up north. So you know, there's that kind of competition happening over there. Uh, Hindustan, as I said, refers largely to the north. Uh, the Tamils would have had their own uh, very strong sense of identity because it has its own history, but the language, literary culture, all of that. But all the same, these still exist within a broader sense that these are all parts of a broader whole. The shape of the broader whole, as we were discussing, isn't necessarily clear to anybody. But that a broader picture exists. Is true. Like people knew that much exists. What about word Bharat? It was also in circulation. I don't. I'm not entirely sure if it was. I don't think people went around saying Bharat Bharat uh, back in the day. It would have been a, a, a set of regional bases, Hindustan, the Khan, that kind of regional sort of uh, larger identities or larger labels. But I'm not sure Bharat was used. So growing up, obviously, we would hear of Bharat, right? You know, quite I almost I would venture to say as much even more Bharat than India at that time in North at least. When did the idea, you know, when when did Bharat start to become in circulation? Was it part big part of a uh, freedom movement? So you know, 19th century onwards, as nationalism becomes more and more important, we are actively searching for a common label. Mm -hmm. We actively need one. So that's when you start finding that people are looking for what is the ideal tag for the country as a whole. Should be Bharat, should be Hindustan, should be just India. Ultimately, the freedom fighters and when they framed the constitution, settled on India. That is Bharat. Bharat going back to a Sanskritic past. It's a very old word, yeah. and it refers, of course, to the land between the Himalayas and the seas, and therefore it's a it's a perfect candidate for uh, that space. India, because that's how the rest of the world has known us, and that's how that's part of our identity also. Just because the word was originally used by outsiders with a kind of twist on the word Sindhu, yeah. and that's how it ultimately becomes India, doesn't mean that it's somehow foreign because we often reclaim things and make it our own. You know that way, even the word Hindu. Is a term that was used originally by outsiders, but we owned it, we took it over, and now we use it. Hinduism is a word that only appears in the 18th century, but today we owned it. We we speak of Hinduism as our thing, even though originally it might have been a Charles Grant who used it uh, with a double O in in what was it 1790 or so. Doesn't matter. So what? We have owned it and we've made it our own. That's how these these labels emerge. So in the nationalistic period, I think they were looking for these common tags, something to unite the entire country. Um, and this was something that, by the way, was it was also a cause for agitation, mm -hmm. because in the in the early 50s, soon after independence, when they had a linguistic states commission mm -hmm. to investigate whether the states should be sort of demarcated on linguistic basis, it was something the Congress had always promised when India was still under the British. But having come into power, they were against it mm -hmm. because they felt that linguistic states would end up destabilizing the country. It would birth sub nationalisms, and the country would end up breaking up because. Language is a very powerful thing. Yeah. So if all the Maharashtrians have a state to themselves, the Malayalis have a state to themselves, the Tamilians have a state to themselves, what is to keep them in the union? They could easily argue that we should be independent nations as well. And there's this line in that linguistic states committee report where it says we're skating on very thin ice or something along those lines because there was a sense of fear also mm -hmm. that the central identity must be given the emphasis, not any other kind of potentially threatening local version of nationalism. Yeah. So it's a, it's always been. Debated. It's always been unclear at a certain level. It's always been sort of, you know, a, a negotiation rather than something that's very, very definite. Even the fact that in 2023 we're discussing whether we should choose Bharat or India <laughs> yeah. shows that these yeah. conversations and these questions mm. keep coming up. Yeah. Which is again not to say it's good or bad. Uh, again, country is also not static. 
uh, values in countries also change over a period of time. Different generations come in. If a country is younger, it behaves a certain way. As it gets older, it behaves a certain way. There are all these things in play. And therefore, you know, these debates will not just, it's not something that happened just in the past. It's happening in the present and it will occur again in future. Because that's just how it is. Right. So, you know, whether we use India or Bharat, right, uh, I'm guessing, you know, in the early 19th century, and I think you were also alluding to that, uh, these newspapers were starting to talk about some kind of nationalism. I guess there was a very strong need for some kind of united front. If you want freedom against Britishers, freedom for which people, for which entity. And I think my understanding is that you know, in that time, if you go back just 200 years ago, there's some parts of the country that British were ruling directly, but there were many hundreds of these principalities, all kind of, you know, interesting arrangement with the British, lot of, you know, people running their own autonomous thing, their own currency also, I think in some cases, you know, and, and so on. So how this idea from such fragmented, at least from the ruling point of view, to creating their one cohesive unit, which is, you know, fighting against the British, how did that emerge, you know, throughout 19th century? So, frankly, in almost as prototypes of this, we see things even earlier. So, for example, in the Deccan, uh, when the Sultanates were ruling in the pre-Shivaji period, there were different factions that were powerful. There was one set that were called the Afakis, or the foreign Muslims would come in from Persia. And there was a local Dakni faction, which was the local Muslims. But also, they were the ones with the Marathas and, and, and a bunch of other groups. Now, both are Muslim groups. But there was a clear ethnic divide, saying, you guys are foreigners who've come on ships, we are locals, you guys have cornered more power, we are the locals, we deserve greater power. So already you see this dynamic of a race, in a certain sense, coming in, who was born where. Yeah. You know, if you're a local person born here, you have the first claim on the, on the resources of the state, you have the first claim on power. A foreigner coming in on a ship, they're not here. They're not entitled to this much power. So much so that uh, in, in, the Go in the Sultanate of Golconda, there's a minister called Madana, who's a Telugu Brahmin. And at one point, he actually, no, it's his brother. He's talking to a Dutch official or something. And he says, you know, these uh, the Persians or the Afakis who come in, they're going to come make money here and leave. We are the ones who are actually going to stay in this country and therefore, la la la. So there's almost like a proto-cultural nationalism being articulated here. He wasn't thinking necessarily in nationalistic terms, but if we look at it retrospectively, we see something that is recognizable, that he's making a case that people who belong here are one, people who come from the outside do not belong here. There's something being made there. In the 19th century, this feeling grows. A lot of it is cultural nationalism. It's often articulated through religion. So if you look at the first outburst against the British, the first big one, 1857, it's articulated in the language of religion. It is that these are infidels. Infidels being who? The Christians. The, the, the East India Company representing a Christian empire, as it were. The Muslims who've been here for long, the Hindus who've always been here, these are the ones who are legitimate uh, claimants to this society. So they actually come together. And that, that language of infidelity is used against the Christians and a, a kind of articulation is formed. But religion is used there. It's voiced in, in, in vocabulary that is religious in nature. Which is to say there was a cultural way in which that language of nationalism was expressed. As we come into the second half of the 19th century, this changes. They start going into a more, what we now recognize as the, the more kind of secular nationalism. We are saying anybody born in this country sort of deserves to be in this country. It doesn't matter what your religion is. doesn't matter what your caste is. The British are the enemies because they've come in from the outside. Economic arguments are made saying that not only have they come in from the outside and ruled us, they're also draining us dry and pumping out our resources into their island. Things like that. Yeah. So that's when this modern idea of nationalism starts taking shape. Mm -hmm. And from there, of course, the freedom struggle happens. It builds momentum. It builds legitimacy uh, for the idea of nationalism. Yeah. Lots of people didn't believe in it, by the way. So there were Indians themselves who were not convinced that we could ever be one nation. Hmm. Now I want to talk and you know, ask more about that. So let me just, you know, my understanding is obviously 19, you know, 1857 revolution didn't go very well. British you know, were able to crush it pretty easily. And after that, I think the also British government took direct control. Till then, they were ruling indirectly. So I think around mm -hmm. that time... No, oh, you mean the parliament took over? Parliament, right? yeah, yeah. Right. Earlier it was East India Company. East India Company, yeah. right. So it was, you know, through the company. The company mm -hmm. was controlled in many ways, but yeah. not, this was not direct rule. Yeah. And, you know, that, so while, you know, British were consolidating, you know, their hold on India, and, uh, you know, this rebellion gets crushed. And then that's probably the early freedom struggle probably starts in earnest around that time. Mm. So people who were involved in creating this national narrative, it's probably a huge challenge for them to create shared language, yeah. shared symbolism, belief in the cause. So 
how did some of that you know say, say is let's say you know from uh, 19, 1857 till 1900 how did you know this national freedom movement start to you know gain steam so to begin with it was an elite thing in the sense that elites realized that they were now going to the same colleges or similar colleges they were picking up the english language and remember in picking up the english language they were also picking up concepts of democracy a, a sort of linguistic arsenal of rights which was used in England and through the English language they were now appropriating it for themselves saying if you have democracy there why not here if you have rights there why not here and you they were sort of picking up these languages from the west and throwing it back at the west saying we there's a moral hypocrisy in this if we are not entitled to this you have to rectify this situation it was not easy uh, there was one 19th century statesman called Sir T. Madhara very little known today but in the 19th century he was considered one of the icons among brown people in India and he once said that if there's any one way in which Indians will become a nation, it is through the railways and the English language. And it's an interesting concept. The railways, because yes, the railways suddenly reduce distances between vast swathes of the country. So it's easier to move around. It's easier for ideas also to move around. Remember that even Gandhiji, who hated railways, who hated machinery in general, he also traveled through the railways and he would stop at every place where his, his trains would stop. He all, all he had to do is come out onto the platform and show his face and the platform would turn into a political platform because he was literally subverting the use of the railways. The British used the railways to move troops and economic resources and things like that. We took over the railways for very different purposes. So there was some truth to that. Railways allowed that to happen. Railways also allowed cultural nationalism to bloom. The Hindu identity, for example. There's a scholar called Maria Mishra, she has this interesting line in her book uh, called, I think, Vishnu's Crowded Temple, where she says that from Calcutta to Puri, it would take weeks to attend the big festival to, of, of Jagannath. It would take weeks for pilgrims to get there. Once the railways got there, you could get there in about 12 hours. So the railways, ironically brought in by the British for their own purposes, incentivized more and more pilgrims, access for more and more pilgrims to a temple was opened up. The temple started booming because more and more people could get there more easily. And suddenly that people's connection with that temple was also sort of strengthened because now they had access. They made use of Western technology for their own purposes. So a lot of the early nationalists were thinking along those lines. There are Western things. How can we reclaim it for our own purposes? The English language is similar, although it's not fashionable to say it. At that time in the 19th century, English was the common language for Indians to speak to each other. There was no other common language. There was no Sanskrit that people could speak to each other across, you know, a different uh, regional divides. Uh, Persian used to play that role earlier, but Persian had gone by then. English had come in. So if you look at the Indian National Congress's very first circular, they actually say all delegates must speak the English language. Otherwise, you cannot participate in this 1885. You cannot participate in this national gathering of people in this, what they saw was the National Parliament of India at that time. You could not participate unless you spoke the English language for practical reasons. What are the key people in bringing you together? You know, what led to like this Indian National Congress coming together and, you know, at even in English, but stating that, you know, we are creating this organization to channel, you know, all our efforts together to eventually work towards our freedom. I think having a common enemy always helps because when you're all, no matter whether you're a Malayali or a Kashmiri or, or a Punjabi, when you're oppressed by the same force, yeah. then you have a common enemy. It doesn't matter. Your differences don't matter so much because you all have to fight the same uh, challenger from the other side. That itself was an incentive for people to come together. Using that original incentive, a lot of these thinkers tapped into cultural resources, they tapped into religion, they tapped into older linkages that existed between, between different parts of the country, spoke of Bharat, they spoke of the older concepts, resurrected Ashoka, resurrected uh, Sri Ram, you know, things like that, in order to energize that concept. But the original trigger was oppression from a common force, just as it works even now, you know, even now if there's one common enemy, you people often sort of put aside their internal divisions and fight that enemy. And by the way, the British knew this also. So the British also tried to make themselves familiar to Indians. So Queen Victoria in 1877, when she declares herself Empress of India, to Indians she declared herself Kaiser -e Hind. She's copying the same position of the Mughal emperors and trying to say that you recognize the Mughals. In fact, during 1857, the Mughal emperor was re reinstated as the leader of the rebels. I'm sliding into that same position. The British started organizing darbars. In darbars in which all these Maharajas would have to gather, people from across India, all the grandees, you know, big lawyer like uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's father, etc., they would end up going to these British darbars. The who's who of India were invited and they would all be decked up, etc., in that old-fashioned Mughal style, again to make the British emperor and, and empress and the British as an idea familiar to the people, saying that we are speaking your language and we are trying to become, ac become accessible to you. 
in the early phases in fact uh, before there was this, a kind of christianization of the empire in the in the 19th century a lot of the englishmen who were in india actively even hinduized themselves or islamicized themselves yeah. they would give grants to temples yeah. they would give endow old things that that you know old muslim kings had set up because they were trying to slide into people's popular imagination yeah. by taking the space that earlier powers had vacated so the british also knew this it's just that at a certain point having become powerful arrogance also creeps creeps in at which point some people started saying there's no need for us to do this you know we are here because god has willed it yeah. uh, therefore you know we will civilize these natives there's no need for us to speak their language yeah. that was also one of the triggers for 1857 yeah. again queen victoria repairs that for a while but that racist contempt still remains and people recognize contempt you know it, it ultimately it does a uh, great on people no matter how much space you give them how much you give some sections of society acknowledgement they will still realize that they are second class citizens and they will not put up with it long term so while you know this uh, freedom um uh, the fight movement was building up it required a lot of intellectual heavy lifting also are there key figures you know who did lot of work to assemble you know those those the symbols and stories and so on to give you know the things which can be repeatedly spoken and create this identity you know against this common enemy like you know who are some of the key historical figures who played a important role in the early days of freedom so there are different types of people doing different things so you take somebody like dada bhai navroji if almost from the 1860s he's talking about this he's not just talking about this he's going to england and talking about it in england right under the queen's nose he sets up something called the east india association i think in london and there it it essentially is a place or a platform for people who are pro india including westerners because remember even in britain there were people against the british empire who said this was not justice that was being done to indians they didn't mean that the british should leave india but they just felt that indians should be treated better still there was some common platform there and he set up that common platform in in england and firstly alerted white people that indians have legitimate aspirations of their own and the thing is once you make a moral case for indian nationalism that itself is energizing gandhi ji at the next level in the, in the next generation takes it to a mass level he mobilizes people who are the masses but it begins with elite intellectuals in the english language making a moral argument for indian nationalism then you have somebody like say rc dutt or bankim chandra uh, in 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 bengal they are writing novels also through novels and literature also they are creating a sense of indians being one people who should stand up uh, to the british history look at the number of people in the 19th century who were writing history books also because history is a way of reminding people in the present that yes you are divided by caste and region and color and diet and all of that but you share a common history ashoka is everybody's ashoka you know you no doesn't matter where you live these historical figures belong to all of us and therefore we must come together even somebody like savarkar who's the father of hindutva he was celebrated initially for his book on 1857 nehru wrote a, a positive review of that book he said the language was flowery but the rest of the book was fine uh he wrote he wrote that uh, history he again tapped into history as a means of reminding people that you are one nations will always tell their histories sometimes it also goes to the level of inventing history in a certain way which is that you get rid of annoying parts that that break that romantic narrative and you construct the romantic narrative it's not academic history but it's a historical narrative with a political goal and for nationalism that's extremely important all countries do it the us has done it uh, the french have done it everybody does it they use history as a means to uh, rouse people and give them that sense of nationalism so there were people like that writing on history uh, then there were just these princely states the divans and the ministers working in the princely states now we think of these maharajas as these caricatures you know they're riding elephants they're oppressing people morning evening they're watching dancing girls that's the kind of thing they did but in the 19th century 40% of india was ruled by the maharajas and for the nationalists in british india that was actually an ideal situation because it proved that you didn't need the british to rule so if they were so dada bhai navroji madhav rao etc they would try to work with the princely states to improve the princely states to upgrade their administration to prove to the british that we don't need you indians can govern themselves as they're doing so well in the princely states and therefore the very argument that the british are here to civilize the the, the natives as it were is not true the natives are perfectly capable of governing so a lot of these indians including dada bhai navroji we think of him as one of the first indians to win an election into the british parliament before that he was divan of baroda in 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 a princely state and he actually writes in his correspondence you actually see this he goes there with a purpose he says that if we make a success of the princely states we make a point to the british and we encourage our countrymen when there's another state called pudukote that is going through some trouble 
And so T. Madhavara writes to a friend of his called Shesha Shastri Singh, please go and become the Divan of Pudukote. Because you and I, as, as natives, we have to take an interest in the princely states and we have to save the princely states. So there's all, even that coming in. And the Maharaja is actually funding this. So when the Congress party also came up for years and decades, it was funded by the Maharajas. Because they had an incentive, the British are pressurizing them, the Congress is pressurizing the British, they will support the Congress secretly to, to sort of... What was the reason? Why was they, this, as I said, you know, 40% of India was ruled by princely states all the way up to 1946. Why didn't British, you know, took over direct role of those? Like, what was their compulsion to let these, you know, princely states, you know, operate independently and have a lot of autonomy to who they are giving money to and so on, their own aspiration and so on? Yeah, because the British never actually... Were, so again, we have this in, like very condensed idea that they were able to force their way into anything and everything that they wanted to do. It's not entirely accurate in that they also, in different parts of the country, faced different challenges. In some places, it was just easier to let the local power centre be and then reach a certain arrangement with them, take parts of their territory, often the best parts, and then leave them there. In some cases, the British actually restored people. So after they defeated the Marathas, the Peshwas, now remember, the Peshwas are Brahmin hereditary ministers of the Maratha kings. The Maratha kings were in Satara. But over a period of time, the Peshwas in Pune had become way more powerful. And the Satara king had become almost like a figurehead. And he resented it, and the Peshwas knew that he resented it. When the British kicked off the Peshwas and defeated them, they actually resurrected the Satara Chhatrapati, Shivaji's descendant. Because they wanted to show to Indians, look, we have removed the usurpers and we have brought back the legitimate heir. Therefore, we are good people. So, you know, in some cases, they've actually even created uh, political situations in order to win some kind of strategic advantage. So it, it, so, it really depends. In some cases, they had treaty agreements with princely states. In some cases, they had no treaties at all. Some places, they took tribute. In some places, they didn't take tribute. It was a very ad hoc kind of thing as it evolved. There was no one agenda. There was no one strategy in different parts, under different people, under different leaders. Things evolved in different ways. So that's why there were so many princely states that remained, and the princely states had their own politics. So historically, we know like the entire you know British rule was very extractive in nature, and the whole you know purpose of the enterprise was to in some way extract value and export in a systematic level. Were they able to also collaborate with a lot of these princely states, like you know because you know you can't leave half the country unexploited if your larger purpose is to extract. So yeah. were they also like you know so, involved at different degrees to enabling that? So again, it's not a fashionable to say, but this extraction thing after a point, I think, ceased to be the main thing. After a point, just being an empire, India was just a prestige element. You know, at a certain point, the, maintaining the Indian empire became very expensive. It was extremely difficult to maintain it. There were rebellions breaking out all, constantly. Even after 1857, every now and then, there'd be something or the other happening. The Beals in the hills, the, the, the Beal tribes, they've suddenly taken up uh, arms against the British. Somewhere else in Maharashtra, there's, I forget the gentleman's name, he, in the, in the 1870s, sets off a, a mini-revolt, tying up with local bands of, of, of robbers and bandits and so on, and then bringing in local people and sets off a rebellion. They're constantly firefighting, the, the British in this situation. So there's, you know, all kinds of stresses and tensions that they're facing, yet there is prestige tied up in it. So as much as extraction, as much as having a huge market is there, so India is a huge market for, for British goods, but extraction itself, there, there are scholars who debate it. So scholars like Tirthankar Roy, they don't buy into this argument that the British were somehow pumping money out of India constantly and starving us uh, out of all resources, etc. But even more... in losing large, you know, like monopolistic access to a large consumer Correct. market. And With very lopsided rules. Lopsided and the pricing yeah. you decide, right. right? And not let the competitive industry develop yeah. and so which can... So, I mean, those things yeah. systematically add up to... Correct. At some it's, degree. It is extraction. It is extraction. It's just a... But, but as you said, they were collaborators also. So in the extractive system also, some people were able to benefit locally also. So a lot of older economic interests waned and collapsed, but opportunities emerged for newer people to come in. And the Parsis of Bombay, they flourished under the British. The opium trade, it's yeah. again, not cool to say it, but a lot of the Parsi wealth of that period comes from being part of the British uh, opium networks and trade and things like that. There's things like that. There's also the fact that assisting the British in setting up the empire were Indians. You know, there weren't that many Englishmen in the country. And so there's a community called the Deshastha Brahmins of Maharashtra. When the Marathas had spread out across the country, remember the Marathas went all the way to Afghanistan, they went all the way to Bengal, they went all the way north to Gwalior, Indore, those places, and they went and established power even in Tanjavur in the south. Huge expanse. As these Maratha armies went out, Deshastha Brahmins also spread out as bureaucrats, support staff, etc. When the Marathas fell and the East India Company replaced them as the mega power in the country, a lot of the Deshastas transferred their allegiance to the British. 
So in fact, in the, in the princely states, you often find that a British resident will come almost as an ambassador of the East India Company. Bringing him with him, he will have uh, a couple of Maharashtrian Brahmins who he will then place in the state in important positions. Often they become ministers in those states. So in Travancore till the 1840s, uh, starting around 1810 till the 1840s, a lot of the state records were maintained in Marathi because the ministers are all now these uh, Deshastha Brahmins. In Pudukote state till the 1860s, Marathi was the language used for the financial records of the state. In Mysore, the, the Mysore Maharaja was toppled in 1830 and the British took over the kingdom for 50 years. Why? Because a rebellion was set off partly with the connivance of the, of the Deshastha Brahmins with the British. Because the Maharaja was slowly trying to get rid of these, what they what were called foreign Brahmins, in favor of local people, and they didn't like it. So they tied up with the British and kicked the Maharaja off the throne for a, for a good 50 years. So there were always Indians who were willing to, to collaborate. Again, this is not to sit in judgment on them. Yeah. Remember that in their time, they were faced with a certain number of choices. Faced with those choices, you have to make the best yeah. of what you have. Yeah. There was no sense of nationalism then. People thought along the sense of caste, community, things like that. And they were like, why not? You know, Our caste has an opportunity to move forward, and therefore we're going to take it and move forward. Yeah. And that's essentially what happened. So again, this is not to judge anyone. Sure. That's, that's just the complexity of this. Right. So and this was, let's say, the you know state of affairs in early days of freedom struggle. Fast forward to you know around 1947. By the time you know the freedom struggle movement was in full swing, I think British were realizing that fighting World War II and maintaining you know this big empire here yeah. is probably more draining than beneficial, at least definitely by that time, and also probably. Globally, also consciousness was changing. You know, it was American pressure. Was yeah, it was no longer a matter of pride, but a, almost matter of shame. Yeah. Do you know we halfway around the world in you know, ruling over so many people and so on without any rights yeah. and so on? So, but what was the national identity by the time uh, you know we gained freedom? Like, what was the idea of India in those days? So again, you have the constitution coming up after the constituent assemblies is, is brought together. They decide that we must have a constitution. There is huge debate that happens. In fact, legal scholars will also always tell you to read the Constituent Assembly debates to understand the idea of India in all its detail because practically everything we're facing even today is actually already debated in those in those settings. For To give you an example, the other day there was an op-ed in the Indian Express, I forget who wrote it, uh, about the institution of the governor. The institution of the governor is a colonial institution. So in 1937, the British had allowed elections in India very small number of people could vote and only certain ministries were given to Indians but Indians were actually governing the provinces and they actually had power. Congress was in, uh, in power under the, under the British system based on the 1935 constitution. But the governor was always maintained as a check. The governor could veto most things. The governor could still control most things. And now because of contemporary politics where governors have again become sort of controversial whether it's Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and so on, this debate is coming up saying why are we having this colonial institution even now? Now the answer lies in 1947. In 1947 we became independent, but remember partition had happened. There were hundreds of princely states. There, were this, there was this fear of sub-nationalisms, different regions wanting to break away, whether it was Tamil Nadu. We had secessionist movements in this country till the 1980s, Khalistan and all of that. In the Northeast, the Nagas never really accepted uh, the Indian state. They fought the British for generations. Once the British left, they started fighting the Indian state. So in 1947, all you see is pressures pulling the country apart which means that at that time people in power felt that they had to be a strong center. So even though the governor was a colonial institution which could veto many things or act as a check on elected uh, governance, we retained that willingly and Ambedkar in fact defended it. Uh, in, that's what the op-ed in fact says, that Ambedkar stood up and said this uh, needs to be taken forward. And that's how the institution of the governor continued. So we inherited a huge part of the apparatus of the, of the colonial state and yet at the same time found our own identity as Indians and so on. So, Having, so till you get independence, the idea of India is almost a romantic idea. Yeah. It's an idea, you know, it's something that's motivated everybody, people are moving together. Once that's happened, once the British have got on the last ships and left the country, then you have to define it in hard terms. Mm -hmm. That's where the complexity comes in. How do you hold all this together? Suddenly that common enemy, which was such a big catalyst for people coming together, has vanished. Mm -hmm. Does that mean people will fall back on caste? Does that mean people will fall back on regional loyalties? How do you prevent that from happening? These questions start emerging. So slowly even amendments are made to the constitution itself. Mm -hmm. uh, freedom of speech, you know, the, a, a man called Aubrey Menon wrote uh, a sort of satirical take on the Ramayan and it was Nehru's government that banned the book mm -hmm. right to the start. And over a period of time, in order for, to, to keep all this together, different compromises end up, ended up being made. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, at the same time, we have the constitution, the idea of India is enshrined in the constitution. Mm -hmm. 
it's not something we've achieved yet. Yeah. Uh, it's an ideal as opposed to reality. Mm -hmm. Constitution abolished caste. Caste is still present. Mm -hmm. Constitution sees men and women as equal. <laughs> men and women are still not equal in the country. There are still women still labor under very many disadvantages. So constitution represents the ideal. It represents what we fought for. Mm -hmm. But getting to that point and converting that representation of that ideal into reality is still an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many debates come in as to how do you even interpret this? Yeah. Can there be multiple ideas of India? Is there only one idea or can these be, can the, even that one idea, can it be revised after a period of time? So it's a, it's a sort of, you know, tricky mm. kind so of So let's bring the conversation to today. Uh, and it's been 75 years and I think as far as, you know, life of nation states or civilizations go, it's a very tiny period of a time, blink of an eye, right? You know, from the larger historical perspective. What is today's idea of India? You know, when someone thinks of India today, how does it differ compared to, let's say, what it, was, it might have been, you know, at the time of independence. I think we've become less ashamed of a lot of things. For example, at a, at a, in my grandparents' generation, money was a bad word. Profit was a bad word. There was this idealism that almost, I think, at a certain level, sapped people of initiative. So it's idealism and, and of, of a kind where everybody only sees a few options that are available. Uh, you're willing to suffer. You're willing to distribute poverty uh, as opposed to making everybody richer. And these are well-known things. I'm not saying anything original. These are pretty well-known things. Now the thing is, we are a much more restless country. People feel no, they don't think wanting to lead a good life is something to be ashamed of. They don't think wanting their kids to have a better life is something to be ashamed of. They don't think wanting a smartphone is something to be ashamed of. They don't think uh, living in good houses, wearing good clothes, these are some things that we should not do or we are not entitled to. There is a hunger for something better. And I think that can be channeled in a very good way in terms of motivating people to actually build something big. And that is really the challenge. Can we channel it into the right kind of direction? Because it, these things can also dissipate. It can also become very scattered. It can become, I mean, already a lot of the economic advantages we are facing, we see a class division, right? People in the upper crust continue to grow, continue to benefit. But people at the lower levels are no longer for the last, you know, uh, couple of decades. They are not actually being... Uh, lifted up in the same way or at the same pace. Opportunities are there, but it's much slower there, which means frustrations can also bubble up, which means there can be internal division also, which can lead to political crises and chaos also, which means we need to therefore be able to hold all this together. So that broader challenge remains the same. If in the 19 1947 they had to literally hold the country together, different provinces, the geography of the country had to be held together. Now I think the big challenge in front of us is holding ourselves together as a society making sure that the benefits that we are reaping are distributed widely. And it, earlier we were distributing poverty, we need to now distribute wealth also. Wealth has to be generated, created. It doesn't mean like literally cutting up the pie, the size of the pie has to grow, which means that is the direction which we must move. In terms of identity, yes, I think uh, in general, Indians are much more vocal about their Indianness. Uh, that is there. People are very, to the level of like chest thumping, sometimes at scary levels. Uh, I'm not very, a big fan of booing at cricketers from other places and, and things like that. That kind of thing is in good behavior. Uh, but yes, in general, I think there is greater self-confidence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a question of whether it's constructive self-confidence mm -hmm. or overconfidence, because mm -hmm. we can also easily slip up. You know, every opportunity can also be a squandered opportunity very quickly. And so, who are the, then, who are the shapers of, you know, today's idea of India? I mean, a lot of it gets shaped by the political narrative, but beyond that culturally, I don't know, Bollywood probably has a big role to play and so on. Like, who are the, I mean, historians, you know, I don't think enough people both write about it or read about it. So I'm not sure, but maybe, you know, over a longer period of time, you know, that's where, you know, like maybe the idea which have deep, you know, weight will probably last for a longer period of time and so on. And this has a way of influencing slowly over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But who are the shapers of modern identity of India? I think it's very clear. If you look at the views your podcast gets, <laughs> I think... Uh, people in your position are definitely speaking to the public uh, and the public is keen to listen. That's one thing. I think we're seeing at some level a transfer of a lot of trust, not from the not entirely, but to a certain degree out of the political class into other people of influence who come from different domains where they've demonstrated their capacity to not just themselves succeed, but also build up something. Something that people see has ripple effects and ends up benefiting larger numbers of people. And there is, I think, an interest in that, which means that in future, we may find that the voices that increasingly are heard are not necessarily the traditional voices. You know, in, in earlier generations, poets could have a big influence. 
you know, you take somebody of Vajpayee's generation, these men were influenced hugely by the literature they were reading, by the poetry they were consuming. They themselves were writers and poets often. There was a whole generation of, of, of politicians, Nehru, Vajpayee, etc., who themselves were men of, of these literary talents and so on. Because technology was limited, how you communicated with people was limited, there was no social media. Newspapers were your key platform. So you would write in newspapers, that's how you reached out to people. In today's world, that's not how it necessarily works. Voices are much more directly heard by people. It's not through print, it's not through mediation, it's through YouTube, it's through other formats. Which means younger generations are also consuming and in informing themselves in new ways. Kids may not necessarily be reading as many books as before, but they're still consuming knowledge through other platforms. Now, the quality of knowledge sometimes is debatable because on YouTube you find all kinds of garbage, uh, you know, all kinds of things. One doesn't want to go down that road. But again, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think that these ultimately lead uh, to good things. People will learn to separate the good from the bad and pick up the right kind of influences. So I think leaders and future shapers of opinion, future shapers of ideas will not necessarily come out of the traditional stables but come out of these unconventional places, unconventional backgrounds, unconventional social backgrounds even. Uh, not from the old elites, but people who found their own way through life. Not from third generation families that have been doing things for, for ages, but from you know, people who built something themselves through hard work and visibly so. So I think there's an interesting set of uh, events ahead of us. Yeah, I definitely think you know, it's a right time to talk more and more about the idea of India. I think India is a, you know, is, 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 it is emerging a very important country in the world. We are now the most populous nation in the world anywhere and the gap is only going to increase. We are also, I think, well on our way of being an economic superpower in many ways over next you know, couple of decades. We continue, cont continue to be a country with a lot of diversity, yeah. which is great. I think, you know, for, you know, we are able to create an environment to preserve and almost celebrate uh, that diversity. That is still reflective of it. So how do we shape the narrative about, you know, what is the core idea of India? How much you need to be homogeneous versus how much diversity is okay? And all some of things, you know, which uh, I think anyone who is, you know, has any influence or a voice or care, I think needs to think about this. And that's where, you know, history also, I think, plays a very big role because everything that's happening today yeah. is a reflection of echo of something happened maybe recent past or a distant past. And one of the biggest thing is uh, colonialism. You know, we were under foreign, you know, rulers for, you know, depending on how you count, 500 years or, you know, 250 years. And that's probably, you know, one area we should go distal, go deeper into and distancing how it's still reverberating, you know, in today's society and, you know, what we, how should we deal with that. But that's a long conversation. We'll pick it up in next episode. But uh, it's great to hear your uh, views, Manu, on uh, this whole, you know, generally the relevance of history in uh, today's society and for the youth of the country as well as, how this you know current identity of india has emerged you know, through centuries thank you at sparks we aim to bring to you stories of exponential impact we share in-depth analysis of what goes behind success stories if you find our conversations interesting you can join us by subscribing to our youtube channel you can also listen to sparks on spotify apple podcast or any other audio platform of your choice if you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve and keep getting better as we go along.